Okay. All right, let's, let's go. So I first got my start into jiu-jitsu when I was 10 years old. My mother was working uh, at a daycare program in a church, and there uh, they were running kids' classes. So I started getting into, um, into jiu-jitsu there, and I think the thing that made me fall in love with it the most was actually the games, the kids' games. Um, you know, growing up in Minnesota with, in, with a dominantly, like, like white population. I think that I was never really bullied as an Asian kid, but I was always unincluded in a lot of activities. And I always wanted to be a part of something and I always wanted to be good at it. So I never really had that opportunity. I would always be like the last kid picked on the dodgeball team. Um, you know, when it came to kickball and things like that, I was never like, I was never the captain and I was never, the, I was always the last one picked. So I think the confidence that I got in the kids games really really motivated me to, to keep on coming because it was like I was finally good at something, people were finally including me in something. So it really gave me that drive and confidence to really keep on going. And it was something that I definitely had an aptitude for at first. And um, you know, just just that constant that constant like taste of confidence every time I came in and got to meet new friends and things like that really really motivated me to, to keep on coming back. And uh, when I was 14 years old, my family, we moved from Minnesota to Arizona, and that's when I got introduced to more of like the West Coast scene of Jiu Jitsu back in 2007. I started training with Megaton and McKenzie, and every year we would go to the American Nationals and the World Championships, going from Arizona to San Diego and to Long Beach. So that, that's really where I got a taste of that high level competition in Jiu Jitsu, and pretty quickly I, wanted, I realized that, that, that this is what I wanted to do for my life. So. Um, Shortly after, um, when I graduated high school, I moved to Los Angeles to train full-time with Cobrinha, and the rest was history after that. I've been out here for 12 years now. So after living in Arizona for four years and training during my high school career with Megaton, I was always a really big fan of Cobrinha, and early on, I believe, when I was starting to get more into the jiu-jitsu scene, Corbino was working out of Alliance Atlanta, and he was doing a lot of good things over there. I noticed that his purple and brown belts were just killing it in the competition back in those days, like Pedro Torres, John Thomas, Jordan Schultz, and a couple of other guys like Alec Balding, and all these guys were kind of shining on like the world stage uh, in those times. And I just noticed that they all had very similar movement patterns and how they were playing guard, like spider guard, and using their guard retention and also how they were passing like knee cutting and tore out doing and I thought it was like such a beautiful style of Jiu Jitsu and I noticed really they were the only ones doing that. So when I had seen Corvinia move to Los Angeles, it wasn't that far from where I lived in, in Arizona, right? It was about a six hour drive away. So when I graduated high school, I decided that, you know, I tried out a lot of different things and, you know, the the college, the college route really wasn't the way for me. I was never a really good student. So all I had was jiu-jitsu. So I remember, you know, I had tried a couple different different places. Like I actually flew out to Maryland to train with Team Lloyd Irvin for a little bit. I was there for a week. And that just didn't end up being, it wasn't right fit for me. I didn't really like, um, I just didn't really like it there that much. And um, I thought about going to Atos too in San Diego, but I never really gave that, I gave that shot. So um, I had a friend that was training out of, uh, Cobrinas and she was telling me how it was like the Harvard of Jiu Jitsu and she had never seen anything like it before so I decided you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a shout out there and after my first class I decided like yeah I definitely want to I definitely want to stay here I want to be a part of this and um, yeah that's so at 18 years old I made the I made the decision to move to Los Angeles and here I am 12 years later still living in LA and uh, chasing the dream. I think what was so special about the 2022 worlds is that Three out of the four matches that I had, well, four out of the four, they were all rematches, but the last three were all matches that I had previously lost. And I remember I had a big, I had a, I had a pretty bad knee injury going into this tournament. Um, I had actually hurt my knee in Abu Dhabi a month prior at, uh, I think at the King of the Mats or one of the Grand Slams. And I wasn't even sure if I was going to compete. So... You know, I did a lot of physical therapy. I was doing whatever I could just to show up that day and be able to compete. So every every match that I had won, especially the ones that I had lost to uh, previously, I felt like I felt like I was getting bigger each match because it was like 
I was, I was absorbing my, my opponent's soul, right? And I just felt like every time I won, I was just so amped up because, you know, in my mind previously, I wasn't even supposed to be there. I was supposed to be on the sidelines because I, I was injured. And each time I had won, I felt like I was just like getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the time like, I, I made it to the final, I had so much confidence. I was so hungry and I was, I was so fired up to be able to, uh, just to be on that stage for the first time ever with you know thousands of people watching. My family was there, my friends were there. And I knew it was my moment. And when I finally got that, that win, especially I believe I was able to score in the last 15 seconds or 10 seconds or something like that. It was such a beautiful moment and like, you know, it was something that I'm just going to take with me for the rest of my life. And I'm going to, and I'm going to be able to use this, if you use this, use this experience of overcoming adversity into other parts of my life. And I remember even thinking like, you know, for years I'd be taking a shower almost every time I'd be taking my shower I'd be thinking like am I ever going to be a world champion am I ever going to am I ever going to accomplish this goal and ever since I, I, I got that win and when I'm in the shower I'm thinking like I'm a world champion you know <laughs> I finally did it but I'm still hungry and I'm still ready for more and like you know ever since I won the world championships I haven't stopped evolving my jiu-jitsu I believe I'm way better than I was when I won in 2022 and I'm just so excited to be able to just take these lessons and taste it, take this experience into the next, into the next phase um, of, of competing at the crown, right? So yeah, 2022 was special. 2023 was rough. Let's end the year good. And then 2024 is going to be, it's going to be another level. So since I became a black belt, I think my game has completely changed, right? I not only had to change the techniques that I was doing, but I had to change how I was viewing jujitsu as a whole. I had to kind of like, rewire my brain how to think and view things less on a technical level in terms in regards to techniques but more on a conceptual level and bio, biomechanic level with like how the how the body how the how the body moves in certain positions and how you can move the body and things like that um so definitely i think my game is comp like if you were to look at my game from blue to like the beginning of my black from the beginning of my black belt career to now and so along the lines of like probably seven years, I think you would see a bigger change for in the last seven years than the years prior, only because the more that the more that I'm changing the way that I'm thinking, the quicker I'm able to add new techniques and change new things, right? So so definitely like I've been able to change things. Not not just how I do jiu-jitsu, but how I view jiu-jitsu, right? Um, and regards to the foot lock, not ankle lock, foot lock. Um, that's something that I started to play with back in 2018. I saw the, the, the butterfly Ashi, the leg configuration, the first person I had ever seen doing that was Mikey. So it was something that I was like trying a lot in competition, but I never really knew how to do. And um, after training with Mikey, we started to do a lot of cross training in the beginning of 2018, up until recently. And, um, and you know, I picked his brain on the footlock and how he did it and things like that. And I was able to kind of add a lot of the concepts that he used and then, all, and then throughout time kind of change things and evolve it into to my flavor of how I like to attack the footlock. So I would say I've been doing that technique for about five years now and obviously one of my favorite techniques. But I think what makes the footlock so special in regards to how I do it is it's not something that I'm always looking for in competition. It's something that, I've, that I'm very good at and that I'm able to see, but when I fight someone, I'm not saying like, oh, I'm going to footlock this guy. It's more along the lines of I'm going to do what I do best, attack, the attack, go for the attacks that I see. And if the opportunity presents itself, I'll take it. So it's less, it's less of me just hunting it the whole time because then I'm telegraphing and everyone's going to be able to stop it. But if I'm able to throw other attacks at you, like upper body attacks, lower body attacks, like sweeps, back takes and things like that, and then force you to address those, once you stop those, that's when I can start to see the opportunities for the footlock and things like that. So... Also, not just it being a submission, but me seeing the position as a guard. I don't see it as just, oh, I'm going to grab the leg and attack it. No, it's like I see it as a, literally as a guard. So I'm still looking for the back. I'm looking for the sweeps, right? I'm using it to get to other positions as well. So when you start to defend those, that's when I can really start to attack the full lock. So I think that's what makes it so special. And that's why it's like such a big part of my game. So it's an honor to be a part of this event. I think that the three other competitors that I'm going to be going up against they are all, they're all masters in their own right at what they do. And I think that it's gonna be a very entertaining event 
myself as a as a spectator, I would be inter very entertained to see this event just because of the style clashes that you can see, um, and uh, just to be just to be able to go on the biggest stage and show my jujitsu. I think it's going to be it's going to be really fun to watch. I think something that I have uh, that a lot of these guys they don't have is just the years of experience. I think that I've been a black belt since most of them have have been like a blue belt or a green belt. So being a little bit older, I do have more experience than them. So I'm definitely going to be keeping that in my back pocket. But um, I think that every matchup that you can see possible from, from the four of us, it's going to be very exciting for the fans to watch. So I'm really excited to just be out there and put on a show. So Pato, I've fought against twice. Um, we fought once in 2019 at the King of the Mats in Japan and in 2021 at the Jiu-Jitsu Con. I think Pato is a really good athlete. He's he's a primarily a guard player. He does a lot of the stuff from his back, like lapel. He likes to be supined a lot and use guard retention to set up upper body and lower body attacks. I think he utilizes the K guard really well to his advantage. I think because he does a lot of nogi, so he's really good at kind of torquing the knee and getting people to like give their backs. He can attack the legs as well. Um, and also, I think that his worm guard is a really good addition. I think that. He showed a lot of evolution in the last year. I've seen, I've been watching a lot of his matches and I think he fought very intelligently at the Worlds this last year against May Room. Um, for him to be able to kind of like, to to stay ahead of someone like that who's very talented like May Room is a very, it's not an easy thing to do. So yeah, I, I like I like his game a lot. I think he's very smart. And I think that he's made a lot of changes since he's been to AOJ. So I'm really excited to see how, how his style matches up against mine. Um, so yeah, I think that he's a good, really good competitor and I'm really excited to fight him again for the third time. And in regards to Fabricio, I've never fought Fabricio. Surprisingly, I think we've been in the same division for, I don't know, I mean, he got his black belt, what, 2021, 2020, 2021. So we've been in the same division now for a little over two years and we've never, we've never matched up against each other. So I think that's going to be really exciting for the fans to see. I think it's pretty obviously pretty obvious what's going to happen. It's most likely going to be him on top and me on bottom. I'm assuming he's probably going to be trying to shoot for a takedown, and and try to try to pass from top with like his fast paced Toriano style. Um, but yeah, I think he's a really exciting competitor. I think it, what makes him different too is his guard. He plays a lot of things from seated guard. Most people are on their back trying to set up like lassos and trying to slow the game down. But he actually kind of brings the fight to you in regards to sitting up and walking into you. And most of his most of his attacks, he's trying to basically get to a seated up position where he can wrestle up, attack loop chokes, ankle picks, um, and, and like, you know, butterfly soups to triangles, things like that. So I think it's going to be a really interesting uh, match between us. I think whatever happens, whether it be me on top or him on top, you're going to see fireworks. It's going to be a lot of fun. I think what Sam does that's very different than most people, especially when he's on top, is he, is he passes to the other side, right? So most people pass right leg forward, they wanna to go to their left. He's left leg forward and going to the right. And I think that um, that throws a lot of people off. And what, it, what it's done for me is really, you know, that's a side that I do like to play, but it, you know, it's something with him, you have to be even more prepared to play because he does such a good job at like angling his shoulders in a way to where he totally shuts off one side. So I think that I think that it's really pushed me to even get better on on that side and work my attacks there, which is something that I don't I don't always neglect. I'm good at it, but definitely with him, it's like you you're not gonna he's not gonna give you the other side. He's he's he'll rather give you his legs than he'll totally give you daily heave on one side than letting you control his sleeve and the other leg on the other side. So I think that that has really made me sharpen up my attacks, and I think that's something that throws off a lot of other people as well. So I'm really excited to see about see how my game matches up with him now. It'll be our, I believe, fourth time competing against each other. One, two, three, fourth. And I think that's something that's really cool about this matchup is that it's constantly pushing us to to evolve our game and take things to that next level. So that's all I've been doing for the last like four or five months is, is sharpening up my tools. So ready for that next one. They can expect to see some all natty jiu -jitsu. Thank you. Thank you. The Quest for the Crown is brought to you by Kings. Crown is also brought to you by Black Armor.